glory it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing o'er my heart will flow. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me of heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me of heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me of heaven, sweetest song of all. Good morning and welcome to the North Lexington Church of Christ. We continue our worship and song this morning with number 523. 523, our God, he's alive. Be wood. Let's stand while we sing. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, He is alive, in Him we live, and we, and we survive from the star God, created man. He is our God, the great I Am. There was a long, long time ago, a God whose voice the prophets heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live. And we survive from dust our God. Created man, he is our God, the great I am. Our God, who sun upon a tree, our life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set man free and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live. And we survive from dust our God, created man. He is our God, the great I am. Please be seated. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll see number 622. 622. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, 
Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. The elders have set aside this time at the beginning of our worship together to come around this table and commemorate the communion that Jesus instituted on the last night that he was alive. We spend a lot of time talking about the divinity of Jesus, uh, the compassion of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. Something I don't think that we talk about uh, too awful much is the courage of Jesus. When he got up from that table, he had the full knowledge of where he was going and what was going to happen to him. And that took a tremendous amount of courage to go forward with. At the beginning of the book of John, John records these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He goes on to say in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and that we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. As we reflect on the humanity and the divinity and the courage and the compassion of Jesus this morning, let us do so in such a manner that it would be pleasing to God. Let's give thanks for the bread. Dear Father in heaven, we are indeed humbled and grateful to come before you this morning and privileged to partake of this loaf which represents your son Jesus' body that was freely given for all, that we might be redeemed to you. We pray this in your son Jesus' holy name.
as Jesus prayed in the garden that last night that he was a free man, we see the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus come together. When he asks, Father, let this cup pass from me. But we see the courage of Jesus when he says, not my will, but your will be done. Let's give thanks for the cup. Dear Father, we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to partake of this cup that represents your Son, Jesus' precious blood that was spilled for all. May we do so in a manner worthy in your sight. It's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before the offering this morning, we'll sing number 500. 500. O oh, thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove, while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Let's give thanks for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we are indeed a blessed people and a blessed nation. Father, we are so grateful that not only do we have physical blessings that we enjoy in abundance, Father, but the spiritual blessings that you bestow upon us. 
And at this time, uh, help us to give in a cheerful way, Father, and in a way that is pleasing to you. And we pray that these funds that are collected will go to further your kingdom and to reach the lost and to bring uh, everyone to know the name of Jesus. And it's in his holy name we pray. Before we let in prayer and scripture, we'll sing number 213. 213. He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart, joy bells ring. He gave me a song. A wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song. He is to me. Out of the way grows every day, walking the heavenly way. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praise to him, my king. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with a chorus, Granny gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. Let's pray. Our kind and most gracious Father in heaven, we come to you as a church. We pray together. Praise your name to give glory to you in this time of worship. That we, through our worship here, will glorify your name. And that by having been here, we will be enriched. Lord, we, as a church, uh, 
have suffered the loss of our members and friends, many passing. Those who are sick, we ask, Lord, that you pray for them, pray for the families who have lost the loved ones, comfort them, Lord. Help us as a church to go to our brothers and sisters and comfort them in their time. We're also thankful, Lord, for the new births that we've had in this church, and we pray for those young parents, and we pray, Lord, that we will stand around them and help them as they raise their children, that they will grow up to obey you. Lord, we are thankful for the many works that are done here at North Lexington, missions, our upcoming Cane Ridge lectures. And we pray, Lord, for those who will make it here, that they will make it safely, that the people who will attend will be enriched by hearing great lessons on your word. Lord, as we, we pray as a church, we have many things that we, we want to bring before you, but as individuals, there's individual things that we think of that we ask to put before you. The one thing that is precious most to us is your son, that you gave for us, that you gave and sacrificed, that he... had the courage to stand and to withstand the humiliation and the death on the cross, the separation, so that we can have salvation and that he can be our mediator. And it is through his name we pray. Amen. In a few minutes, Brandon will be speaking to us about the campaign that some of the members of this congregation went on to Ica, Peru. And as that is the case, the scripture reading this morning will be in both Spanish and English. So this is first Spanish. Hechos, capítulo 20, los versículos 32 hasta 38. Y ahora, hermanos, os encomiendo a Dios y a la palabra de su gracia, a aquel que tiene poder para edificar y para dar herencia para entre todos los santificados. No he codiciado ni la plata, ni el oro, ni el vestido de nadie. Vosotros sabéis que estas manos proveyeron para mis necesidades y para aquellos que estaban conmigo. En todo os he demostrado que trabajando así es necesario apoyar a los débiles y tener presente las palabras del Señor Jesús, que dijo, más bienaventurado es dar que recibir. Cuando había dicho estas cosas, se puso de rodillas y oró con todos ellos. Entonces hubo gran llanto de todos. Se echaron sobre el cuello de Pablo y le besaban, lamentando sobre todo por la palabra que había dicho que ya no volverían a ver su cara. Y le acompañaron al barco. Now we're reading in English. This is Acts chapter 20. Uh, beginning in verse 32. Paul here is uh, in the middle of his talk with the uh, elders of, Ephesia, of, of Ephesus. Acts 20, starting in verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all, for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Do 
been following along in the hymn of the Song of Invitation will be number 454. 454. Now before the lesson, we'll sing number 571. 571, if you would, let's stand again while we sing. <clears throat> Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the Master speaking today. Going afar, upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again, back again. Into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are sore. Leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. Going afar, upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again, back again. Into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Thus I would go on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way, going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again back again into the fold of my Redeemer Jesus the Lamb for sinners slain for sinners slain please be seated Good morning, and welcome to this worship assembly. We are honored by your presence and grateful that everyone has chosen to assemble to worship the God of heaven. To do that together is a blessing. B A P four eight. Seven. That little code means nothing to you probably. It has significantly impacted the last month of my life because those numbers represent something. Those numbers represent a license plate that was affixed to the front of a vehicle that I was given the opportunity of driving in Latin America. So for a week, 10 to 12 people at any given time and for any intervals of time up to about four and a half hours were at my disposal. A disposal that has changed my life. An, an, an event, a circumstance that is, that is different because let me assure you, I cannot get in a car right now with my beloved wife without being reminded you're no longer in Peru because what you learn very quickly is that when you drive in Peru and this is your help now, now let me be honest Tiffany and even Ashton did a great job navigating me through the streets of Ica Peru However, if you'll notice carefully, that is the entirety of the front seat of this vehicle. And you will notice there aren't any Ica natives in this front seat of this vehicle. So if the, if the front 
vehicle that, that I was following were to take a misturn or to, to miss, I was to miss a light, if I were to get too far behind, that's a problem. But they did brilliantly. So because of this, you're forced to do two things. Understand the compulsory nature of the horn and the customary two nanosecond following distance between you and the vehicle in front of you. Because should you get less than that, or your hand should by peril miss the horn, you will be in trouble. So you might imagine, for someone who's never driven in such conditions, people begin to look a little funny when they ride with you. <laughs> and in fact, it crossed my mind to take an image of my wife while riding with me because it's a very similar expression. Fortunately, those things have normalized. So you understand the purpose we're here today, to worship. But in, in the confines of that worship, we want to talk about an activity that we did together. We're going to discuss a mission effort. Now, it's my attempt to bring to you the mission field. That's why I asked Wit to lead our scripture reading in Spanish this morning. I wanted you to have the feel of the foreign field, and Witt is particularly gifted in his knowledge of the Spanish language, and we will miss that greatly. But, but, but why? Why, why, would we, why would we take a group and join together on a foreign field with 80 folks? Why, why would 15 people, most of whom are represented in this photo, but not everybody, why would we do that? Well, there are probably a number of reasons. There are, there are unequaled experiences. And that goes without saying. Sometimes those are physical and sometimes those are just emotional attachments you make. There, there's sometimes a value to the undesirable sensation. If you'll notice carefully, these three fellows, two of whom are from Kentucky, one of whom you'll recognize very well, are doing something that I generally forbid. And that is walking barefooted on Peruvian or any international dirt. It's an uneasy sensation when you're conditioned to understand some disease process, but they're doing it. We'll talk about why in a minute. But I don't think the value of that experience is lost on David. Sometimes it is an unforgettable experience, an interaction with a person. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a little sweet girl or maybe it's an older sweet girl. It just makes you laugh and that you love. But ultimately, we have an unparalleled task. You see, this is the emphasis. The emphasis of this report is not what we have done, but what we should do. And I want to be clear about this. We're not here to celebrate what we have done together. We want to seek to consider what we are to do together. Matthew 28, you recognize, where Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. To do this, we're going to concentrate on Acts chapter 20. I invite you to open your Bibles to that text. Acts 20 is interesting. Wit read for us the conclusion, the, the very tender and emotional experience of, of great sorrow and weeping. But in thinking about the chapter, it impresses me. I doubt seriously that it began that way. I mean, you think about it. You're, you're the Ephesian church... The church at Ephesus enjoyed the privilege of having Paul as their full-time preacher for two years. They have a deep relationship with him. He, he, they, they have a special relationship. So Paul, traveling through, as it were, sends word from Miletus, Hey, I'd like to meet with you fellows. I want you elders to come. Can you imagine how happy they were? There is not any indication that I can find anywhere in the Bible that his communication, come meet with me, indicated that he was going to put them under a spiritual browbeat. I would imagine whenever they got this invitation to travel and meet with the Apostle Paul, they were ecstatic. This would have been a great opportunity for them to rekindle the relationship, 
to receive some additional instruction. I'm sure that friendship, that earnest love that they shared would just make that a precious moment. And if you let your mind just imagine a little bit where the Bible is silent, which is dangerous, but, but if we do that in this case, we can just imagine whenever they first greet each other, the warmth and the joy and, and the stories that probably were exchanged. And it didn't end that way. It didn't end that way at all. And, and verse 38 concludes with this interesting little phrase. Sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. Most of all. You see, these thoughts hit me square in the face. Because what we're discussing this morning, what is my priority? When I'm thinking most of all, what impacts me? What influences me? What drives me? What compels me? Well, to do this, we take Acts chapter 20, we're going to look at Paul's interaction with the Ephesians, and then we're going to seek to make a personal application from what he shares with them. Paul's interaction with the Ephesians. If we read chapter 19, which we won't, we get to the account of Paul's entering the city of Ephesus, his, his work with them, his labors. Notice he made an investment with them. Let's read together verse number 18. Acts 20 verse 18, Paul when they had come to him, said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I lived among you. Paul's conduct was an investment. He lived in a certain way in front of people. Why? To serve them, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Do you understand what this means? We only serve the Lord when we serve other people. I lived in a certain way before you serving the Lord, thereby rendering a service to you, and we should do that. Because we're Christians, are we not? That's what Jesus came to do, right? The Son of Man did not come to be served, Matthew 20, verse 28, but to serve, to give His life a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. We're His servants, so we serve every way that we can. And there's a couple of images right there of a couple of really sick babies, one of whom, one of the pediatricians with this suspected may have been critical if we hadn't been there. The child had pneumonia of a pretty advanced degree, apparently. But you serve people. You do what you can. You go about doing good, just like Jesus did. You go about rendering kindness to folks, taking care of their needs, recognizing them. And you do this with an attitude of selflessness. Drop down to verse number 33. Paul says in verse 33 and 34, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know. These hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. That is selflessness. Recognize what he says. In contrast to the multitude, the majority of people who live, when Paul was interacting with people, he had no objective of obtaining from them. I didn't come to you coveting what you had. When you go to a place like this, you can't. Do you want that? Think about why sometimes we refuse to be engaged in certain activities. Generally, it's because we don't sense a return. But Paul said, I've coveted nothing from you. You have nothing physically that, that I need. So I didn't covet you silver or gold. That's, this is the, the love, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 or 5, love does not seek its own. Love does not envy. Now, love doesn't look at people for what they have and hopefully what they can give us. Love looks at people as merely souls in need. That selflessness. And whenever that selflessness takes root, you work with your hands, just like Paul said his hands did. It's not an idle thought. 
Working with your hands is an investment in people's life, a fruit of selflessness that requires any number of things. Perhaps it's two young, strong boys carrying a man who can't to a baptistry and gently as possible folding him into that baptistry. Because this person's needs more important than mine. I will, I will make myself uncomfortable. I will take off my shoe. I will, will dirty my clothes. I will ex exert some effort in this case because I'm following the example of Jesus, just like he said in John chapter 13 when he, when he shockingly takes off that outer garment and proceeds to go around the room and wash the dirty feet of his apostles, telling them why. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. I am showing you that you need to lower yourself to a position of servitude for others. And when we do this, we make an investment. This investment is a fruit of sympathy. Verse number 35 begins this way. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this, you must support the weak. The reason I like these images, and they're not as clear as I wish they were, is these, these guys are literally supporting the man. Support the weak. Get rid of self and think about others. As we therefore have opportunity, Galatians 6.10, let us do good to all men. These are enemies. But especially those who are of the household of faith. Sympathy. Our service will flow from it. And that sympathy means we're going to do things. What we can. Maybe we take blood pressure. Maybe we administer an injection. Maybe we have a skill that allows us to see and treat a young child. And maybe we just help dispense medications to people. All of those things are part of the sympathetic concern of reaching out to other people, of rendering good to them, of investing, making good use of our conduct. Now, here's where I get tripped up, because you know what I have to think about when I'm preparing this lesson? How much of that did I do this week? Oh, you see, it's real easy to say, wow, I spent two weeks in Lima. I spent two weeks in Ica. I was in the mission field for two weeks. So what? Brandon to congregation, so what? What have you done for me lately? The world is crying. Sympathy, selflessness, the necessary components of service. But so too, Paul's conduct demonstrated sacrifice. Verse 35, beginning in kind of the middle part. Remember, he says, the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give, to give up, to sacrifice than to receive. Sacrifice. Ooh. Sacrifice is a difficult thing sometimes. Sometimes it means you get up early in the morning. Sometimes it means you stay up late at night. Because you're giving up your time. You're giving up your energy. You're giving up your day. You're giving up something. But always with great determination. Great determination to... to impact, to influence. Why? Because that's what we're expected to do. That's what Philippians 2 is about. You remember how it starts. Let this mind, verse 5, be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Think like Him. Gear yourself like Him. Build your attitudes and your worldview and your perspectives around Him. Think like Him. Look at what He do. Who being in the form of God did not consider being on equality with God robbery, something to be grasped or held on to, but emptied Himself. 
came in likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, given him a name that is, among, that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's why. It's a determination to think like Jesus, to, to view the world, to view people, to view situations through a divine eye. To the mind of a servant. Paul made an investment. But Paul's conduct also involved instruction. Notice how he communicated with them. Let's turn back to verse 20. Paul says, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. I have tried to retrain myself to avoid using the term medical mission for this reason. The medicine, the medical component, is really just a tool to allow people to be exposed to the Word of God. It is a mission trip. It's Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. I want to share with you something from Acts chapter 20. It's a blessing to my life, and I hope it will be to you. I want you to notice how Paul emphasizes teaching, because what he's going to do in context is he's going to use five different words, five different Greek words, to describe his communication with the Ephesians. And each of these five things communicates something to us, something that should really dictate and define everything that we do and say and teach. Notice what they are. Verse number 20, I taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul says, I taught you. That, that's a Greek word that you would recognize because it's almost like our word didactic. It means to teach, to give information. Therefore, the teaching that he did emphasized rationality. A faith that isn't built on understanding and knowledge and information is not faith at all. They shall all be taught of God, Jesus said in John chapter 6, 44 and 45. Acts 17, 11, why were, the, why were they so, so noble in Berea? Because unlike the Thessalonians, they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were true. You see, the teaching, the communication involves rationality in various settings. And the images that you saw reflected a lot of those. Sometimes it's a public worship assembly in an evening setting. Sometimes it's in the course of the operating of a clinic and somebody says, yeah, I would like to study the Bible. And, and you take them aside and you teach them. And sometimes, most often, it takes place at their doorstep or at their place of business or in their house. Every setting he taught. Verse number 21. Testifying to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Testifying, that's your second word. It means about what you think it does, only it's emphasized. It means to bear witness, but it kind of has a Greek explanation, exclamation point added to it. It's emphasized. It is the bearing witness, the giving truthful testimony, a statement as to the veracity of the teaching. It is something that can hold up in court. It is true. It is honest. It is honorable. And it leads to submission. Because whenever you teach in this way, notice the emphasis. Faith toward God and repentance. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus. Now that should sound familiar. Submission to the will of Jesus is critical. You've obeyed from the heart the form of teaching delivered you, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17, 18. Titus 1, verse 2. How do you get someone to that point? You share with them the Word of God who cannot lie. It is true in every respect, and when that truth bears, takes a place in someone's heart, you know what happens? The same thing happened in Acts 2, 38. What shall we do? 
And he told them the truth, repent. Interesting. And to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise is to you, your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Then those who gladly received the word were baptized. And that same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. It's the same God who commands repentance, Acts 17.30. It's the same Jesus who said, Go preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Submission. Submission. I'm pleased to announce to you that during our two-week activities, there were 673 people who received the Bible study in some degree, 423 different studies, and 20 souls recognized the truth and submitted to it. But what happens when that occurs? Go to verse number 25. Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching, there's our number three word, the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Preaching. A word means to herald, to carry the hear ye message of a king. This is a word of authority. Hearing the word, salvation, authority, well, that should make sense. Because when one receives the word, and recognizes the truth, and acts upon it, what happens? Well, Paul commended the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, you receive the word as it is in truth, the word of God. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, those who do not obey the gospel will receive his everlasting punishment. Acts 2 verse 47, those who were being daily converted through the teaching of the word were added to the church daily. Why the church? Because it's the body, Ephesians 1 22-23, Colossians 1 verse 18, and... Jesus is the head of the church and the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5, verse 23. What are we talking about? We're talking about a group. We're talking about individuals. We are talking about a kingdom, which is precisely how Jesus described it. When he was talking to Peter in this context, dealing with his identity, you remember what he told him? When, when, when Peter correctly identified him, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, you're Peter, and upon this rock, what you just said, I will build my church, and I will give to you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to build it, and I'm going to give you the keys. The church, the kingdom, a system of authority, and there are Christians every place that this is obeyed. This is a very dim picture of where the church, this particular congregation in Ica, meets. You'll recognize kind of to your left, a small garage door, a room that's about 8 by 20, I would estimate. That's where, previous to this campaign, the church in this part of Equal, Equal is meeting. Now, during our campaign and during our efforts and do some other things, we were able to, they were able to purchase that second area or rent it. So effectively, they went from a church building that is about the equivalent width of our aisle and about a third of the depth, to a space like this. I can't tell you what a blessing that is to people. It's an incredible blessing to them, but they're meeting and they're working. Look at verse 27. I have not shunned, he says, to declare to you the whole gospel of God. Declare, there's your fourth word. This is an interesting word. It's a compound Greek word. Bank gives it a couple of different kind of perspectives, but the, but the one that we're going to emphasize is this one. It's a combination of a prefix, up and record. Suggesting, according to Vine, the source of its, of its origin. It is recording up. In other words, taking down and delivering what came from above. This emphasizes that when we teach, we have to teach the entirety, the whole counsel of God. 
surface understanding won't get anybody to heaven. Surface understanding will not allow anyone to enter heaven. Surface understanding won't do it. We have to teach the whole counsel of God, and people need to thrive for it. And, and you, in a mission field, you might do that in a number of ways. The whole second week was devoted, at least in design, to going back to people who were converted to Christ and teaching them. There were new convert studies every night. Sometimes you would follow up with people from previous campaigns. Why? To give them substance, to help them to desire, 1 Peter 2, verse 2, the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow. To compel them, to help them, to educate them in their need to give diligence to the Word. To present themselves approved to God, 2 Timothy 2.15. Substance. The entirety of God's Word. Now let me tell you, those efforts work. And here's how I know, because you might recognize that lady. If you were here for this report last year, you would recognize her as a new convert. As someone who was baptized into Jesus. You're going to recognize her as having a secondary picture. In fact, it was related to this one where she was given the first Bible she ever had. I'm sad to report to you that between campaigns, she had drifted away back into the world. And I think it was a Wednesday night. I watched this woman come forward in what was arguably the most emotional restoration and statement of repentance I've ever seen. Why? Because people need the whole counsel of God. Because learning the whole counsel of God is what motivates behavior. It's what restores the lost and pleased to announce that she was. Let's look at our final word, verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn every one of you night and days with tears. To warn. To warn of dangers? There are spiritual dangers. You better believe there are. Galatians 1, 6 through 8. I marvel you're so soon removing away to another gospel, which is not. But there are some who would pervert the gospel of Christ. Even in Paul's day, this was happening. And it has ever since. And that's dangerous because it leads to vain worship. Matthew 15, 9. Success, though, is within our grasp. Because of men like Reuben Chalcon, who preaches this congregation, or perhaps his brother-in-law, Paulino, who preaches across town at another congregation. And did you see those good Christian folks? Now look at this man. This man's name is Carlos. Caleb Lindsay over here knows Carlos very well. Because a year ago, he and Tim Reynolds spent a considerable amount of time studying the Scriptures with Carlos. Carlos was baptized into Jesus on the campaign last year. And you know what he's been doing ever since? Working. He has been faithful every day. In fact, he was described as one of the most active and faithful members of the congregation. Do you see this man? That is his normal posture. Now, he's, he is engaged in a work, an activity here, but he's, he's one of the most active members. That's what Paul's interaction did. That's what Bible instruction does. But let's notice briefly, intimacy is cultivated. Verse 32 reads, So now, brethren, I commend you to God, to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up, to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and the word of His grace. Notice a couple of things related to this. Scripture is related. I commend you to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. Now that should, that should intrigue us, because Paul's telling them, I'm not going to be back. I can't do anything else for you. But the word can. It can build you up. It can give you strength. It can make you thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You don't need me. You need the Word. And when that Word is taught 
and faithfully applied. It gives you an inheritance among the sanctified. It results in sanctification. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus prayed in John 17. 1 Peter 1, 22, you have purified your souls. How? Listen. By obeying the truth. This is sanctification. This is intimacy. It involves Scripture, but it involves giving people over to the sovereign and to God. That's why at the conclusion of this, verse 36, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. He prayed. He commended them to God. And he demonstrated it by praying, by, by acts of supplication. And sometimes that's all you could do. Dr. David Wilbanks is perhaps the, the quintessential prayer leader on a campaign because he frequently does, perhaps all the time, seemingly, with his patients. Why? Because sometimes that's all you can do. And we should pray always. First Thessalonians 5.17 James 5.16, because the effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. It works. I commend you to God, to the word of His grace. But now notice the sorrow. They all wept freely, fell on Paul's neck, and kissed him. Sorrowing. Most of all, for the words that he spoke that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. Let me tell you, when separation occurs, things are different. This is the campaign, this is the compound where all that medical thing was taking place a week later. Let me tell you, it was eerie. Because every place activity was taking place, there was none. Now let's quickly make some application. All right, what's this mean? I want you to notice three things. The great burden and sorrow created by this interaction between Paul and the Ephesian elders is, I believe, very instructive because it encourages us as Christians to be involved. They sorrowed most of all. Let's put this in perspective. Look at verse 32. I commend you to God and the word of His grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. We talked about this. Paul had reached a point where he had done all he could do. He could never come to them physically again, at least as far as he knew. His, his opportunity to help them was gone. You and I must maintain sensitivity to the fact that there are unfulfilled opportunities. And we have a very limited period of time to accomplish it. Because our life is a vapor. And so are the lives of the people in our lives. We must work while it is day because the night is coming where no man can work. There's a very limited opportunity in which we can do things. And Paul knew that and he had reached it with them. He had invested in them. He had communicated to them. He had done everything within his ability to do it. But at the end of the day, he was... And it created sorrow. Most of all, this is Ruth. You don't know Ruth. I spent three days with Ruth. Portions of them. Studying. She, she's so confused by the teachings of the religious world. So confused by the doctrines of men. So receptive to teaching of truth, but so... So skeptical. Oh, I wish I had more time. Because she was getting it. She was a bright Bible student. We must remain sensitive to the unfulfilled opportunities. Number two, we need to have sympathy. Verse 32, which is able to give you an inheritance. You see, we need to have sympathy for the unsanctified majority. Do we sorrow? 
It, my heart's prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Is that mine for my community? For my neighbors, for my family, for my co-workers? You know what Jesus said? The Creator said, you need to enter the right gate and travel the right way because very few take the right way. Jesus said, you take all of humanity, the populace of all creation, and a very small minority of them will find their way. We need to be sympathetic to the fact because if obedience to the truth gives us inheritance among the sanctified, that dictates the conclusion that those who have not obeyed the truth have not been sanctified. Have no inheritance. We must be sympathetic to that. Sorrow for that most of all. And this gives us sobriety. They wept. They kissed. Sorrowing most of all that they would, they would not see his face anymore. Modesta. Modesta. This image doesn't show you three days before when we met her on the street. This image doesn't show you the day before we studied for a couple hours. This image doesn't show you the hours before where we were studying with Modesta, and Modesta was picking things up, and she was asking questions from the day before, and she was recognizing truth, and she was teaching us, as it were. She was getting it. Modesta's living in fornication. She knows it. And we had great lengths about helping resolve that. In fact, made plans to do it with her, but... but but we couldn't at the time. We were running out of time. And let me tell you, when that team of six people walked away from her house and we turned around and she stayed in that dirt-filled street to watch us around the corner, and as we turned, she gave a little wave. Let me tell you, there was more than one tearful eye. We need to remain concerned. Sobriety. Because we have unfulfilled opportunities. And we have an uncompleted duty. That duty is to win the world as many as we can. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. Romans 6.23, the wage of sin is death. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that death is separation from God caused by sin. The solution is submission to Jesus Christ. Let me encourage us to pillow our heads on this thought. Blessed are they who mourn, if they shall be comforted. What do you sorrow about most of all? You see, the answer to that question determines a lot of things we do in life. And the answer to that question is in reality the reason that we do evangelistic kind of things and why we should do more and the heart with which we should approach the world in which we live. Because... We're not talking about a good thing that we did. It was good, and we should rejoice that God was glorified and pray that He was, and will continue to be because of that effort. That is a blessing for us and for people in ways that we can't appreciate this side of eternity. But what drives us? Are we sensitive and sympathetic and sober I think it will help us to make that call, send that card, ask that question, have that study, and let's conclude it this way. There's no more urgent need in all of the world 
and the salvation of a single soul. No more urgent need than the salvation of a single soul. Is that soul yours? You know, the Bible's true. The Bible says you're lost in sin without Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey Him. And when we, when we repent of our, we repent in our life and turn to God, and whenever we, we believe in Jesus and His identity and fully accept that identity in obedience to Him and being baptized in water for the remission of sins and living faithfully for Him, let me tell you, that's a blessing. And that's an urgent need. And, and if, if you're questioning that, if you're thinking about that, you don't leave here without saying it. Because we want to study with you. I want to study with you. There are people in this room who want to sit down with a book. Not a tradition, not a creed, not propaganda. Sit down with you with the truth, with the Word of God. And say, let's just study it. You make your own choice. But there is also no more urgent need than the salvation of one soul. That one soul can be ours if we're a Christian, if we've gone back to the world and we're no longer sorrowful about things that are spiritual in nature, but things that are physical have taken over. And if we find ourselves there, we probably won't make it. Because the world's going to get us. <laughs> and if it's gotten you, you can repent and pray to God for forgiveness of that. We did a good thing. We're not done. We're not done. And if you want to help us achieve that objective together, won't you come as we stand and sing? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Please be seated. Morning, everyone. Uh, if you're visiting with us, I want to extend you a special welcome on behalf of the membership here. If you would take a minute and fill out one of the red cards if you're visiting with us. It should be on the pew in front of you. Uh, use one of the stickers on the back as a name tag so we can greet you by name. Uh, members, please fill out one of the blue cards. 